Uh, good, good day, everyone. So we are uh, David and uh, Dr. Lovella de Vinegracia. And today we'll be your host on a workshop on designing a theory-based metacognitive alternative assessment, uh, a learning companion. So the workshop has the following objectives. First, uh, to introduce the position of the metacognitive theory of the Vinegratia in the OBE framework. Second, to present a research-based strategy for the integration of the theory to educational practice in the form of an alternative assessment. And third, to allow the participants to produce their own design of an alternative assessment based on the metacognitive theory. So in line with the objectives, our workshop has three sessions. The first one is the position of metacognition theory in OBE, followed by the design-based research application for teaching and learning. Uh, and finally, the workshop proper and the presentation of outputs. So here is the abstract of our workshop. Our study exploits the potential of metacognition and metacognitive strategies to answer the gaps in the online implementation of teaching and learning. This resulted to a strategy for designing a theory-based metacognitive alternative assessment, the learning companion, which we wish to share with you today in this workshop session. So to begin, I would like to invite Dr. Devine Gracia to share with us the position of her metacognition theory in OBE. Uh, good day, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, having us here today uh, in the International Network Outcome of Outcome-Based Education uh, Summit, first virtual summit in 2022. So um, actually what we, our, our, um, our position actually is that uh, the role of metacognition plays a very, uh, very important um, integration in the process of learning. So outcome-based education has meaningfully set direction on how humanity should view life and how education should lead the learning individuals and society into the very essence of its existence and purpose. So the complexity of living and learning in the first 20, 21st century demand empowered individuals who can responsibly contribute to the diversity of the challenges at hand. The ability of a person to identify problems and navigate around in order to bring potential solution outcomes and thrive reflects one's holistic strength that begin within. Okay, so in this workshop, um, we believe that uh, metacognitive thinking is very important. We make use of this such that we propose a big reflective understanding process that can empower every learner to develop such strength and ability in dealing with day-to-day -day tasks and learning. Okay. So this is actually the inspiration behind the theory. Uh, when we want to empower learners, it is very important that we have to understand the very nature of who we are as human beings. So it's always good to begin to seek for the truths that come from the universal source if we want to make a difference for the highest good. Okay, David. So let's always take note that uh, outcome-based education underpins this very important um, interest in, the, in this study, in this uh, theory development. So outcome-based education speaks of the ultimate essence of education toward developing total learners and eventually become total leaders who are stewards of humanity and the world. And so we can oftentimes hear Dr. William Spady, the founder of um, the Outcome-Based Education uh, International Network. And it's really one of, uh, it's been always advocating on the belief that outcome-based education always upholds that all students can learn and succeed, but not on the same day in the same way. Okay. So OBE articulates that uh, total learners are those who demonstrate significant and uh, functional attributes. So if you look at the diagram, uh, these are the fundamental life performance performance roles, and we believe that um, 
metacognition plays a very important role in achieving all these life performance roles. So primarily, we can look at the, we can observe in the diagram that the fundamental and the basic attributes that uh, we need to understand about our learners and the individuals who are under our care in the teaching learning process that they are learners, but they are as well as thinkers and that they have to be listeners and at the same time to be communicators. And for them to be a total learner who are thinker, who are thinkers as learners, we are expecting them to become creators and producers and that they can as well become planners and designers and eventually problem finders and solvers, implementers and performers. In the same way that in the communication as, uh, and as being listeners, we are expecting our learners to development potentials to become future total leaders who are teachers and mentors. They can be supporters and contributors, team members and partners, leaders and organizers, and uh, of course, in general, this what constitute as a basic fundamental functional attributes of our uh, learners at different stage of life. Okay, so in other words, um, this is the baseline or this is the very springboard or idea where we think that metacognition has to, has to be considered when we are designing an instruction in developing these basic attributes for our learners. So this, this what we're going to present today is actually an attempt to make use of the metacognition theory in empowering students' learning. So we call this as designing a theory-based metacognitive alternative assessment, a learning companion, uh, because actually this initiative, this innovation was made uh, during the height of the pandemic, wherein we only have a remote learning uh, modality and uh, we cannot have our face-to-face -face classroom learning. So in this sense, we saw the importance of um, reflective thinking process to be a very uh, essential element in developing learning tools, learning materials in order to empower our learners to learn on their own, especially that many of them oftentimes are left alone to do their work. And we are talking about this in the basic education. And so with this, I would like to introduce David, my partner, my co-author of this study, to present to us today uh, what we have done in this study and this research. Uh, thank you, Dr. Love. We now proceed with the design-based uh, research application for teaching and learning in alignment with what Dr. Love has discussed. Uh, so we begin with the contextualization of the need for metacognition in teaching and learning. So uh, here is the background. So we have, due to the pandemic, classes have migrated online. And with this comes several online learning challenges. According to Perry, Griffoni, and Guzzo, we can classify these challenges as either technological or pedagogical or social challenges. Technological challenges include access to the internet and devices. Pedagogical challenges refer to the struggles involving instruction and assessment. And social challenges include the demands on the learning environment and the social situation of the learners and the educators. We turn our focus here on the pedagogical challenges. So one solution identified that could answer some of these pedagogical challenges is the use of metacognitive strategies. So this was mentioned earlier. As Anthony Sami indicates, metacognition allows students to take charge of their own process of learning, such as thought regulation, assessment of own ability, and evaluating personal strengths in delivering the tasks successfully over a given period of time. But before that, we might ask, what is metacognition? So what is this metacognition that we are talking about? So metacognition is cognition about cognition or thinking about thinking. It refers to the ability to reflect, understand, and control one's own learning or thinking. Metacognition has two major aspects knowledge about cognition, and regulation of cognition. 
Knowledge about cognition is concerned with knowing about one's own thinking processes, while regulation of cognition is concerned with how these thinking processes are regulated and monitored. Shaw and Denison have indicated that metacognitively aware learners are more academically performant than their metacognitively unaware counterpart. And the underlying reason for this is related to their use of metacognitive strategies. These researchers have also developed an instrument to measure metacognitive awareness, a set of 52 questions that compose the metacognitive awareness inventory, classified according to knowledge about and regulation of cognition. So over the years, there have been several studies on metacognition. For instance, Zoe Kipley found a correlation between metacognition and the academic performance of the learners. Terlecki and McMahon held that metacognitive strategies can be taught. And Jalil discovered that there is no significant difference in the metacognitive awareness of secondary learners when classified according to locale, gender, or school management. With regards to the role of metacognition in mathematics education particularly, Alzerani indicated that the traditional method of teaching may hinder metacognitive learning of mathematical concepts. Chan Fang and Li also highlighted the importance of self-efficacy and intrinsic motivation when understanding the relationship between metacognitive knowledge and math performance. So that ends the contextual basis of our, of our workshop. So now we proceed to the next section. Okay, we're in, we're going to discuss uh, the theoretical framework that we used as basis for our alternative assessment. So we present the metacognitive framework developed by Divine Gracia. So this is the uh, framework. I'm going to discuss each of the different parts one by one. So starting off with the seven metacognitive processes. So Divine Gracia was able to identify seven metacognitive themes when it comes to math problem solving. Mathematical problems, typology, nature of the problem, awareness of math knowledge and thinking, personal strength and MPS, emotions and beliefs, values and needs or attitudes in MPS, mathematical thinking associated with hand and eye motion, and metacognitive solution qualities. Now, the last one has actually several subconstructs. Okay, so we have different processes under the first one, which are called the micro metacognitive processes. So the first one is diagnostic, followed by the scanning, searching, and referencing, or the SSR, direction steering, rectification effect, restoration, pattern seeing or seeking, predictive, evaluative, natural flip of thought, and time consciousness and control. Additionally, the theory indicates three metacognitive uh, stages or macro metacognitive stages. So the first one is known as the big understanding process stage, followed by the conceptualization of the mathematical solution strategy. And finally, it will end in the execution of the conceptualized mathematical solution strategy. So how do all these different parts interrelate with each other? So we begin with the core phenomenon, which is the meta-awareness of mathematical knowledge and thinking. This is activated by the first two themes. Okay, so altogether they are called the task-related knowledge. And this is also driven by the other three themes, altogether called the effect and motion experience. So these two, the task-related knowledge and the effect and motion, are considered to be the nurture factor, which together with the nature factor, okay, so together with the nature factor composed of the metacognitive solution qualities eventually leads to successful mathematical problem solving. So that is the end goal of the entire process. However, despite these studies, the utilization of metacognitive strategies among students are low. Additionally, Anthony Sami recommends that an experimental design can be conducted to examine the actual use of metacognitive strategies among students in online learning. He also held 
that only a few studies have been conducted on metacognitive skills, especially in Asia. Moreover, there are no known studies utilizing the theory of the vinaigrettia as a basis for intentional metacognitive instruction despite its merits in understanding the relationship between metacognitive process and mathematical problem solving and its potential for application. So at this point, I would like to ask if there are any questions. Okay, so I think uh, we need to proceed. So we are given uh, two hours and uh, practically uh, what David uh, was trying to say is that um, metacognition is really very important that uh, when we try to design our lessons or we think of an assessment or any other learning activity, then um, the higher executive function has to work. Uh, in such a way that our students will be able to re re really reflect upon uh, what they are doing, what they're trying to understand, what they're trying to, um, to make meaning about making sense of a particular idea or concept that uh, is being introduced to them. And aside from that, that metacognition uh, is not only about you know, um, reflection about your cognition, but it's also about uh, feeling about your feeling. So it's a reflection about what one's feel as well um, in a given circumstance, particularly in the in the teaching learning process. So, uh, well, psychology will tell us that um, metacognition is uh, functions as a higher executive function that uh, is resp responsible responsible for um, for operating regulating the per whole performance process of the mind no? um, according to Loria and even to the study of Sternberg and uh, Sternberg uh, they have pointed out that uh, we have what we call meta components so we have acquisition components wherein and that level of cognition uh, the, the what's happening in the teaching learning process that we allow students to acquire, assimilate new information. But uh, with the use of this new newly acquired knowledge, um, there are some kind of complex thinking that would require really a performance. But what's responsible for the performance, the success of the performance, is actually when the meta component, the higher executive function, will really regulate on this performance thinking. And so that is the only time that uh, we can be assured that success will really be attained. So in this case, it's somewhat um, these theory patterns you know, that uh, uh, that kind of thinking required in a given problem so situation, problem solving situation would require the same process of thinking, the, the same demand of complexity of thinking wherein the higher executive function really has to function to regulate and ensure the success of the performance level uh, cognition. So uh, this time, I think David is ready for us to um, give us the design and implementation of uh, the theory base. So actually, um, the, the, the contextualization, the application of the theory here is uh, being utilized to uh, basic education. But uh, we believe that this is still applicable to any level of uh, teaching learning situation or conditions or environment, okay? Um, as we listen, probably we can get some insights and try to reflect at the same time while David is sharing with us how um, a learning companion, uh, we call that, no, um, was developed in order to help our students learn some mathematical mathematical concepts and processes. At the same time, it's also an opportunity for us teachers to evaluate, to give value to how students have learned, not only in terms of the quantity, but uh, more importantly, the quality of uh, their understanding and um, their application of their understanding to certain mathematical tasks that are given to them. So this time, uh, David, um, we can now proceed. 
uh, how you were able to utilize the theory by designing uh, a theory-based metacognitive alternative assessment. Okay, thank you, Dr. La. So we proceed with the design and implementation proper. So in our work, we identified uh, the different objectives of our alternative assessment. So we group this into three. We have for the first one of cognitive. So we have the following uh, objectives accurately define important mathematical concepts related to the topic using the table organizer. Second is accurately execute procedural skills related to the topic using example problems. And third is to develop their own strategy for solving problems related to the topic using a method of their own choice by the set deadline. As for the effective area, we identified the following objectives uh, to meticulously challenge the advantages and disadvantages of their developed strategies. And second is to openly share reflections on the development of one strategy and the entire learning process in at least two sentences each. Okay, and then third and last, we have psychomotor. Accurately copy mathematical equations using the table organizer and independently master graphical or problem solving skills required using the example problems. So these are the objectives of our alternative assessment. An important quality or characteristic of our work is the idea of alignment. So the first one, we have the first alignment. We, we had to align the alternative assessment with the learning competencies of the school curriculum. And then for the second one, we also have alignment of the alternative assessment objectives with Bloom's taxonomy. So as you can see here, for the cognitive, the first one, we classified it under understanding and remembering, the second one under applying, and the third one under analyzing, evaluating, or creating, which we classify as HOTS. Okay, and the others, we classify them as LOTS. So the first two here, understanding, remembering, and applying are lower order thinking skills, while the last one are higher order thinking skills. Then we also uh, classified the effective objectives according to the Bloom taxonomy. So both of these are under responding and valuing. And finally, for psychomotor, the first objective is under imitation because they are asked to just copy the mathematical equations, while the last one can be classified under precision uh, because they are asked to independently master graphical or problem solving skills. Then we also had uh, alignment number three. So for the third alignment, we focus on the alignment of the different uh, alternative assessment objectives with the metacognitive processes from the theory of the Vinegratia. So as you can see, for each uh, area, like cognitive, we identified what metacognitive processes are being uh, studied. Okay, so for the cognitive, we have the first three metacognitive processes. For effective, we have the next two. And finally, for psychomotor, we have the last, not really the last, it's the sixth metacognitive knowledge of mathematical thinking associated with hand and eye motion experiences, uh, metacognitive process. Okay, then for the seventh theme, we actually use the subconstructs to identify what are the possible uh, MSQ or metacognitive solution qualities that might be observed for each of the following uh, objectives. Okay, so we have cognitive, affective, and psychomotor. Again, I would like to emphasize that the important part here is the alignment. So the activities in our um, alternative assessment are as follows. So we have a table organizer, then we had a part where the, the students or the learners identified mathematical procedures, followed by the development of a problem solving strategy, the determination of the advantages and disadvantages of that problem solving strategy, and it ends in a reflection. So just to emphasize, uh, the consideration when doing the alternative assessment is that 
first, it should be aligned with the school curriculum learning competencies, then with the different levels of Bloom's taxonomy, and finally, with the different uh, metacognitive processes from the theory of the Vinigratia. So now I would like to share with you what uh, our table of specification looks like. Okay, so there. So this is the uh, table of specs for our alternative assessment. So this has been presented earlier on some parts of it. Okay, so again, this is the alignment of the objectives with Bloom's taxonomy. Then we have the alignment with uh, the metacognitive processes. Okay. And here are the uh, items. Okay, so we have just labeled them. And on the right, this is the learning companion itself. So this is uh, somewhat, although we, we took away other information just to show the template. So this is what we used as a learning companion. So the first one, we had a table organizer followed by uh, a box of definitions and notations, and they will be the one to classify that. Then there's a part where they will be identifying mathematical procedures from the lessons, okay? And then we also have the development of a problem solving strategy. And then they will identify what are the advantages and disadvantages in this part here. And finally, they will reflect, okay, on the entire process uh, via the following question. So going back, uh, so that was our table of specs and the alternative assessment proper. Okay. So let me just proceed with uh, the next section. So now I will show the results of the evaluation of the design-based research application. So as we had mentioned earlier on, uh, we actually implemented this to a group of students, to a group of learners, okay? And I'm going to discuss uh, how did it help uh, the learners with regards to their learning, okay? In terms of the results of our study. So I'll begin with, uh, discussing the alternative assessment itself. So the alternative assessment is actually uh, a 22 item uh, AA or alternative assessment that was developed and deployed for six to nine days with uh, the following sections as I have uh, discussed earlier, uh, the table organizer, the identification of the mathematical procedures, the development of the problem solving strategy, uh, the, determining the advantages and disadvantages of the, of the uh, problem solving strategy, okay, and a reflection. So the alternative assessment obtained an average validity rating of 3.77 and an average usability rating of 3.70 with four of the highest based on three ratings. Then for the data gathering part, so we had uh, two sets of data gathering and also two sets of data analysis. Okay, so for the first one, we had a pre test and a post test that was held using the MAI. So I have mentioned this earlier the MAI is the Metacognitive Awareness Inventory, which is a set of 52 questions, okay, that was used to be able to identify or to uh, obtain uh, the metacognitive awareness of the students. Okay, and this was uh, classified as a whole and is categorized into knowledge and regulation and cognition because metacognition has these two groups of uh, or two different areas, knowledge and regulation. And for this data that we have gathered, okay, so we had the following data analysis. The means and the standard deviations of the pretest and post-test data were computed as a whole and was categorized into knowledge and regulation of cognition. So a right-tailed paired t-test was performed given the computed parameters 
with a significance level alpha equal to 0 0.05. Now for the second data gathering. So the AA scores or the alternative assessment scores of the participants were obtained and we were able to get an alpha of 69.15%. So a 30 item summative assessment or SA enterable in an hour was prepared as part of the class routine with 50% higher order thinking skills items or HOTS. The SA or the summative assessment scores of the participants were also obtained and the alpha was calculated to be 51.11%. As a whole, and is categorized into HOTS, higher order thinking skills, and LOTS, lower order thinking skills. Validity was ensured by the math teachers. So this was checked by the math teacher. Uh, for the data analysis, we correlated Okay, the AA and the SA scores. So we calculated for the correlation coefficients as a whole and is categorized into HOTS and LOTS. And we were able to obtain uh, the Pearson correlation coefficients and we compared them, okay, using uh, the significance level alpha equal to 0 0.05. So here are the Statistical analysis results. Okay, so for the first one, uh, the descriptive analysis shows that the mean post test scores, okay, as you can see, the mean post test scores are higher than the mean pre test scores as a whole. Okay. Let me just uh, point it out. So uh, the mean post test scores are higher in terms of uh, when it is categorized as a whole, as you can see, and also when categorized into knowledge of cognition and regulation of cognition. The standard deviations are relatively similar for both the pretest and the post-test. Now, for the results of the t-test for the pre-test and post-test data. So it shows that the difference in means is statistically significant as a whole, signaling that the alternative assessment has increased the metacognitive awareness levels of the learners, of the grade eight learners. When categorized into knowledge and regulation of cognition, only the latter is statistically significant. So for knowledge of cognition, as you can see, that is not statistically significant. This gives us evidence to support the idea that the alternative assessment has actually helped improve the student's regulation significantly, okay, but not their knowledge of cognition. We also calculated the Cohen's D, and results show that the effect sizes fall between the small to medium range. This just indicates that the effect is not negligible for all cases. Next, with respect to their alternative and summative assessment scores, table three shows that all students scored above or at cut off, okay, for the alternative assessment. As you can see, uh, 23 of the participants scored above or at cut off, while none of the students scored below the cut off score. While, uh, meanwhile, for the summative assessment, 14 of the students scored above or at cutoff, while nine of them scored below the cutoff point. Finally, we show the correlation coefficients of the alternative summative assessments data. So the correlation analysis results show that as a whole, the, uh, the AA and the SA, or the alternative assessment and the summative assessment scores had a moderate and positive correlation. Okay, so as you can see, R is 0.47 with a significant p value. Okay, but when the SA is categorized into HOTS and LOTS items, the correlation between the HOTS and the AA is also moderate and positive, while for the LOTS and the AA scores, it is weak and positive. For both the former cases as a whole and as classified according to HOTS, 
the correlation is statistically significant, as I have mentioned earlier for the uh, first categorization. So these results indicate that those who do well in the alternative assessment tend to do well in the summative assessment as well. This, coupled with the result that the alternative assessment improved the overall metacognitive awareness of the grade eight learners, points towards the idea that for learners who had better transfer of metacognitive learning from the alternative assessment, as reflected in their scores, may have translated these skills into the summative assessment, especially for the HOTS items. Although further investigations are needed to establish this, uh, studies such as Snyder and Artel have shown how metacognitive instruction can impact mathematical performance. So for the last part, when classified according to lots, we can see that uh, the p-value is not significant. So now we, pre we present the interpretation of the findings. So from all of these, from the data and the analysis, okay, so we can say that the theory-based alternative assessment may be a viable tool for metacognitive instruction in the classroom setting. It has increased the metacognitive awareness of the learners, and those who do well in it tend to do well in the corresponding summative assessment. The alternative assessment still needs improvement, especially in improving the knowledge of cognition of the learners. But the current work may serve as a prototype for future theory-based metacognitive instructional materials. Okay, so here are our references. At this point, uh, may I also know if there are any questions? Okay, Dr. Banu, may I know if there are anyone asking? Any questions from the question box? Okay, so I'll take it that there are no questions. So at this point, I would like to give the floor back to Dr. Love for the workshop proper. Okay, actually, uh, Brian, um, David, uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, um, maybe uh, we can we can take a break and then we can wait for the questions. Okay, okay. Uh, that's for an hour. Uh, to complete our hour for uh another twenty minutes to wait for the questions, and then afterwards, then um we can go back to the workshop proper. It seems like uh, we have a, a different setup here. And so maybe we can wait for the people and we cannot expect that there will be responses in the workshop proper. Since this is a live stream, okay, um, presentation uh, of workshop. And so I guess when we proceed to our next part, which is the workshop, maybe we can uh, illustrate to them how uh, you manage to come up with your TOS, Okay, how uh, a workshop can be done such that the one that you have prepared last time wherein uh, you prepared two tables so that we can demonstrate the part wherein uh, probably supposedly there will be a true workshop here. But since it seems that it's a live stream, you know, telling of the things that um, we can impart to our listeners, to our participants, that I guess it's better that uh, we ourselves will be one to demonstrate how they can okay. probably supposedly participate at this time. Since they cannot do that, then maybe we can wait a little bit. Uh, the time now is 7.41. And uh, maybe we can ask Dr. Banu if uh, she has already something in the, in the question box. Uh, Mr. Faizan, if you can help us facilitate on this. Yes, please tell me. Yeah, uh, we would like to, to uh, ask if Dr. Banu who already have questions in the text, has questions in the text box. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, she will ask you when she gets the messages or questions. You can carry on. Let's carry on the session. Faizan. Um,
Yes, you guys are live streaming now. Yes, ma'am, you are live now. You are live, still live. Yes, yes. Dr. Dr. Love and David will proceed with the session. Yeah, uh, Dr. Bandu, we would like to ask if there are some questions before we go to the workshop. Uh, but since we understand that it seems it's not doable to really ask our participants to do the actual workshop, then uh, after answering maybe some questions, we can demonstrate some of the things how David uh, really, how we actually made of the, uh, of the workshop thing, or the template that we have prepared. So we are waiting if there are some questions in the in the question box so that we can answer it live. Ma'am, there is no question yet. You can you guys can carry on the session. Okay, so there's no question. Okay, then uh, David, maybe we can we can proceed to the workshop now and then we can just do a little of demonstration, okay, of the yes, one that you presented. But in the workshop proper, this is supposed to be for, for anybody who uh, supposedly have participated in the session and we are uh, expecting that there can be a diverse group or diverse people uh, uh, coming into this into this um, workshop, and we understand that they might be from higher education institutions. They people might be um, teaching in the graduate programs. They might be teaching in the undergraduate uh, bachelor's degree program, or even they might be teaching in a technical vocational, or even in the basic education. So actually, we're supposed to uh, give them this workshop wherein they're going to apply the theory on metacognition in coming up with their own uh, activities, okay? What David and I uh, did was actually innovating, trying to come up with a learning material that will help our students learn while they're doing it in their own pace, in their own way, in their, in their independent time, without the, the teachers on their side uh, by using the, uh, the alternative assessment, okay? And in that alternative assessment, if, uh, if we have understood it very well, it utilizes the different metacognitive processes that uh, David had explained about the theory and how these metacognitive processes um, are giving us an idea on how we can help our students learn in a more reflective way, that the very companion that they have when they're learning independently, aside from themselves, uh, is actually the learning companion. Uh, it's a, in a it's an organizer, and at the same time, they're very they're, they're selves as well, themselves the, who are studying while we are reflecting on the things that they are reading from a module, reading from the book, reading from whatever references, or even watching videos or uh, trying to download some. Uh, learning materials. So in this case, there are only three things. If this is supposedly an ideal uh, workshop, okay, uh, where they're imagining that we have a venue with us here and we are gathered in an actual face-to-face -face situation, then let's try to think, uh, for example, on how we can conceptualize our own learning companion using the theory, okay? The learning companion that you can give to your students, or even if you are a trainer, uh, for a professional development, okay, so think of whatever learning companion that you can develop as a material uh, to scaffold to help our students, especially those who are independently learning on their own, okay? And second, think of any outcomes of significance that you intend to design a learning companion for. So regardless of your context, regardless of the level of education you are with or in whatever manner where in education is there, even in the professional development, in the continuing education, in the graduate program, or even developing skills, whatever outcomes of significance you are teaching or you are implementing, designing a certain teaching learning experience, um, then this model 
that David and I had created based on our study can actually help us. Okay, so you can think of it and try to design or think what learning activity can you design in such a way that it can utilize the reflective thinking way. Our students learn, our trainees, okay, uh, other professionals, training professionals who are learning new job, learning new tasks. If we have a target of outcomes of significance for them to demonstrate later on, then think of what learning companion can you design that will be making use of the different metacognitive processes. So the third, the third thing that we supposedly um, should be doing here at this very moment is to formulate that activity that would enable your students to exercise their metacognitive processes. So in other words, it's really very much translatable. If you will be asking, well, it's a theory that is applicable to mathematical problem solving, but what, what about if it's not a mathematical problem solving? We just have to go back to the fact that problem solving is a thinking performance. And so regardless of the context, whether it's mathematical or not, we can agree that the thinking patterns are still applicable. That whenever we think of something at a certain domain or a certain subject matter or context, still this high executive function that is regulating what we are thinking is still at work. So in other words, thinking patterns still applicable to other fields. It can be translated into different contexts, into different domain. And so much more that it will give us much opportunity to study how this processes and how this theory works in a particular domain or context. So maybe as a message for everyone who are here today or listening in this video, um, the message that we can share with you is that we can try this out by innovating certain learning materials that can help our students improve their learning, at the same time empowering them on making ways and means in learning their own, on learning their own way. So since we do not have any participant to work with us today, and so maybe we what we can do is that. Uh, David is going to share with us how he did, how he practically put things into templates, into something that is doable and that can really be very practical for anybody who would like to uh, try this out. Okay, David, so maybe you can show the templates that uh, supposedly will be the work of our workshop. And from okay, there we can, yes, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, so, Dr. Love. So um, this was the simplified activity that we had, but actually we also had uh, activities before that we did to be able to show um, how we are able to do this uh, learning companion. So let me just share it. Yeah. So let me share with you, this was one of the templates that we created. And we actually did this in a prior workshop. So in this particular case, uh, we were presenting the workshop to a group of mathematics teachers. And just a, a context that uh, this was in the Philippines. So the Philippines, we are using uh, for, for secondary education, uh, the usual, uh, the schools are under the uh, Department of Education which we call the DepEd, and uh, they have a set of uh, competencies in their DepEd mathematics curriculum. So what we did uh, in a prior workshop was we asked the participants to determine 10 mathematics learning competencies, okay, based on the year level that is assigned to them, okay, the year level that they are teaching from the DepEd mathematics curriculum, which is the curriculum for secondary schools. And then we have uh, shared with them uh, the file in a Google Drive, and we asked them to write down the different learning competencies in the following table. Okay, so as you can see here, 
So we have 10 blanks here. So we just ask them to fill that in with uh, competencies that they are teaching or they would like to make an uh, as alternative assessment for or the learning companion. Then from there, we ask them to come up with five activities, okay, for their own learning companion. So here they are being asked to uh, give an activity name and then a brief description of the activity. So again, this is a design process. So it's actually going to be uh, undergoing a cycle. Okay, so first they just think about an activity, they give a name, they describe it, and then after that, they classify each of those learning competencies and, and proposed activities based on the following objectives. All right? So objectives and metacognitive processes. Ideally, okay, in the ideal setting, um, or I mean not really ideal setting, but maybe normally in the classroom, you're actually being asked to determine your own objectives for the alternative assessment. But in our particular case, to make the uh, activity simple, we just identified the objectives for them. And we also mapped what metacognitive processes should be found for those objectives. Okay, so we, we did this part, we just gave this to them. But in actuality or in reality, it should be the instructor or the teacher who should also design that or determine what should be the objectives for a particular alternative assessment. Okay, and what processes should go into each of those objectives. Okay, so in our particular case, we did this. So we simplified it and we gave them this particular template. So uh, they're going to check which learning competency do they want to, to align or to map to a certain metacognitive process and to a particular um, alternative assessment objective. Right? So for example, if the learning competency is um, understanding square roots, okay? So it could be one of the activities is uh, like we showed earlier on a table organizer, wherein you're going to identify the definition of a square root from a box of definitions. So that could be one activity. So we could put in here, okay? So the first, learning competency, learning about square roots. And then for the proposed activities, maybe we could put there what I suggested earlier, uh, the definitions or box of definitions as a proposed activity. So that's one possibility. So actually it, it's, uh, it's really a creative process. So you can, uh, what do you call this? You can actually explore you know, different, um, uh, different types of activities, and different combinations, okay? And this, what we showed you here, gives you just a template, okay? Or a guide on how to be able to achieve that. So actually that's the bottom line or the main uh, output of our study and what we also aim to show in our workshop. How do we create a learning companion, okay? Which uses metacognitive theory in helping our learners. Okay, so um, uh, Dr. Love, I think uh, I'm done with the discussion on this. Yes, actually, this is what we can share with uh, our uh, one of our innovations on the use of the theory, and hopefully uh, there will be more people uh, accessing the theory so that they can uh, try it out, apply it to whatever um, innovations that uh, they can do in their own respective uh, learning activities. So this is not only applicable for, for grade schools, but they can also be for uh, even for tertiary higher education and even for graduate programs, as long as there is always a design that we do for for learning experience or a design that we are uh, making for a learning material, then I think it's also uh, very important that we have to consider how these designs of materials and the uh, learning experience be considered 
no, in the in the manner that uh, we have to think as well how our learners will think and will make use of all these materials and uh, learning experiences. So I think uh, that's all that we can share for today, and I hope uh, everyone uh, will be able to uh, to gain something from this presentation. So thank you very much once again. That's all. Welcome, Welcome in. Thank you.